In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is our first actual class. Last week we had our preface, or our introductory class. Tonight our class one, what we're calling our Orthodox Survival Course. To summarize what we discussed last week, our Orthodox Survival Course will be primarily a study of an Orthodox understanding of history. How God has acted upon man in history, and especially the history of the Church as being, after God, the most important agent in human history. That from our, the, the true point of view, the orthodox point of view, the history of the world is really a history of the church in her dealings with the world. So the church is the kingdom of God on earth. The, the, when the, the church, her life is a prism through which we understand the meaning of the world, why God created the world. And, and her activity in the world is, is the real history of the world, right? So we're going to go back to the beginning and ask, when did the church begin? Now, we could have begun our course before the beginning of the world, because <coughs> in a sense, the church existed before the beginning of the world. We could have started with the beginning of the world. We could have started with Adam and Eve in paradise, or we could have started with the formation of the old Israel. All of those are important points at which we could say, in a sense, the church began. Also, in our also, customarily, we say the church began at Pentecost, right? The New Testament church, the sending, the receiving of the apostles of the Holy Spirit and their mission to go forth and preach began at Pentecost. So, in a sense, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. But in the, if we actually read the Holy Fathers, they, the Holy Fathers actually don't call Pentecost the birthday of the church. And if you look at the texts of the feast itself that we chant every year, it's not actually called the birthday of the church. And why is this? And there's a very interesting insight here. <coughs> this is the Synaxarian section of the Horologion. The Horologion is the basic book we use for the church, the daily church services. Right? It has a skeleton of the basic. I was using it tonight when I was chanting Vespers, right? The basic prayers that we do every day from church. There are also sec a section called Synaxarion. There's an entire book called Synaxarion that gives the explanation of every feast day throughout the church year. So in the Synaxarion, for Holy Pentecost, we read this. Some erroneously hold that Pentecost is the birthday of the church, but this is not true. For the teaching of the Holy Fathers is that the church existed before all other things. Okay. In the second vision of the Shepherd of Hermas, the Shepherd of Hermas is a second century AD document that's from the time we're going to study tonight, the early church. And the Shepherd of Hermas is, uh, is uh, full of the, the, the vital eschatological vision of the early church. And I'll explain what that means later on. Um, but in the Shepherd of Hermas we read, Now, brethren, a revelation was made unto me in my sleep by a youth of exceeding fair form, who said to me, Whom thinkest thou the aged woman from whom thou receivest the book to be? I say, the Sibyl. Or the Sibyl is a, the Sibyls of the ancient Roman pagan prophetesses. Right? So the author says, Well, is the Sibyl giving me the book of these revelations? And the youth says, that, Of course, the youth is a... Um, is, uh, the youth is Christ. I say, the Sibyl, thou art wrong, he saith. She is not. Who then is she? I say, the church, he saith. I said to him, wherefore then is she aged? Because he says, she was created before all things. Therefore is she aged for her sake. The world was framed. For the sake of the church, the world was created. <coughs> right? St. Gregory the theologian speaks of the church of Christ both before Christ and after Christ. The church both before Christ and after Christ. So we, we speak, of course, of the Old Testament church. One time I, I, had a, I wrote a, a letter to a, a Roman Catholic who uh, was upset because somebody was calling Moses Saint Moses. He says, well, no, we only call saints, people saints who lived after Christ. And I wrote back and said, well, why is it even in your ancient Roman calendars you have Saint Moses and Saint David? Well, he wrote back, oh, you don't understand. You Orthodox don't understand anything. Oh. And he, he couldn't. He couldn't really respond to this because, of course, the church existed, in the, the Old Testament church existed before the coming of the Lord. Um, St. Epiphanius of Cyprus writes, The Catholic church, which exists from the ages, is revealed most clearly, most clearly in the incarnate advent of Christ. St. John of Damascus writes, The Holy Catholic Church of God is the assembly of the Holy Fathers, Patriarchs, Prophets, Apostles, Evangelists, and Martyrs, who have been from the very beginning, to whom were added all the nations who believed with one accord. According to St. Gregory the Theologian, the prophets established the church, the apostles conjoined it, and the evangelists set it in order. 
the church existed from the creation of the angels. For the angels came into, now that was the end of the quote from St. Gregory. Now the Synaxarian goes on. The church existed from the creation of the angels. The angels came into existence before the creation of the world. They've always been members of the church. We don't think about that often. The, the, the angels are members of the church, right? They're here present at the liturgy. At, when the priest at the proscomedia, uh, the proscomedia is a section of the liturgy in which the priest is preparing the bread and the wine. Remember, we studied that in Holy Wisdom. Mm -hmm. The priest is preparing the bread and the wine for the offering at the, at the, at the liturgy that, that he's doing quietly before the liturgy begins, right, in the altar. And there's a point where the priest takes out particles of the prosphoron, of the holy bread, for all the ranks of the saints. And so, so what's going on on the discus, on the, the holy paten, where the bread is being offered, is that the entire church is present. First of all, Christ himself, the holy lamb, which will become the body of Christ, right? And then a portion for the mother of God, a portion for the saints, and then the living and the dead. And the first rank of the saints that's commemorated is the angels. So why are the angels remembered at the liturgy? We don't have, they don't have sins to be forgiven by the sacrifice of the Eucharist. Why are the angels remembered? You see? Members of the church. They're members of the church. Right, they're members of the church. So the Eucharist is not only for the forgiveness of sins, which it is, right, of all the living and the dead. It's also the union of all in the church, including the angels who actually outnumber us. How do we know the angels outnumber us? Because... Um, our numbers will only reach up into the number of the angels who fell from heaven. Right? According to the Holy Fathers, the consensus, we don't, this is not a dogma, but the tradition of the church is that more or less one-third of the angels fell from heaven. And the world will exist as long as numbers need to be added to fill up their number in heaven, which is why they hate us so much. The demons hate us so much. Right? So there will, there will always be more of the good angels than there are of human beings who ever existed. So you might say the, the majority of the church are actually angels. And beyond that majority is all the saints that have gone before us. So when, whenever we feel lonely, or that, well, the Orthodox are so few, or, or we're so despised, or, you know, people are leaving the church. Uh, there are fewer and fewer people in the churches. We're worried about that. We're worried about the priests disappearing. There aren't enough priests and so forth and so on. Always remember that the vast majority of the church is already in the kingdom of heaven. We're already with the majority, right? <coughs> That, that, that's a given. Right? Uh, today, people are always worried about being in the majority, right? We have, because of our politicized society, there's a word about majorities and, and outvoting each other and so forth. Well, we're already with the majority, right? The majority is in heaven. And that was even before the beginning of the world, because the angels are our eldest brothers in the church. St. Clement, a bishop of Rome, says in his second epistle to the Corinthians, and by the way, the Epistle of St. Clement is written around the year 110 A.D. or 100 A.D. So it's one of the earliest writings after the New Testament. St. Clement, a bishop of Rome, says in his second epistle of the Corinthians, the church was created before the sun and the moon. And a little further on, the church existed not now for the first time, but it's been from the beginning. So the church is the assembly of all the angels and saints and all who have been incorporated into the body of Christ from before the beginning of the world until the end of the world. But for the sake of our the brevity of our course, because we don't want to go on and on, um, we have to have a certain uh, boundaries for our course to make it manageable, we're going to start with the New Testament church, with the early church. But this background of thinking of the church as be existing even before the coming of Christ is very important for our understanding the early church. So, history, as if you look at B, down at the beginning of the, uh, the end of the first page of the notes, all of history, from the beginning of the world until the coming of Christ, all of history really is a preparation for the coming of the Savior. Okay? The entire Old Testament is a record of history as a preparation for the coming of the Savior. And remember, we've also talked about the fact that the Fathers teach that all, even all of pagan history was a preparation for the coming of the Savior, because he was... He revealed himself to the Israelites directly through revelation, through the patriarchs and prophets, through the law of Moses, and so forth. But he revealed himself indirectly to the nations in indistinct images and teachings, even though their religions were very distorted, right, because they were influenced by demons. Yet at the same time, because they're all from our first parents, Adam and Eve, they all had an ancestral memory 
in, even, though in, in distorted ways, of the true God. And their mythology and their rituals could not help but indistinctly or partially manifest truths about the Christian faith. See? So all of history really is a preparation for the coming of the Savior. Now this is true in the historical process itself. Now looking at the Old Testament now, there are three ways that the Old Testament is a preparation for the coming of Christ. It's true in the historical process itself and what actually happened. The whole unimaginably great panorama of this history from the creation of the world, the Garden of Paradise, the fall of our first parents, the casting out from paradise, the lives of the early patriarchs, the, the, um, the, the life of Abraham, that this, this one man became the father of, of, of faith for all nations. The, the history of the Israelites' slavery in Egypt, their deliverance from Egypt, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, and then the, 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 their being occupying the Holy Land, and all that went into that, and the history of the tribes, so the 12 tribes, and the judges, then the history of the kings, and all the, the, the prophets and their prophetic warnings, and the, their exile from, from the northern kingdom and from Jerusalem, their return from exile, the period of the Maccabees, the, the period immediately before the coming of Christ, this vast panorama of history, this process, the very process itself is a step-by-step -step preparation for the coming of the Savior. And also within the New Testament, in the text of the Old Testament, the words of the prophets, the prophet David and the Psalms, and all the, 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 the four major and the, the 12 minor prophets, and many words spoken by the patriarchs uh, were prophecies of the coming of Christ. There are, there are literally hundreds of prophecies of Christ. So when people say, they, they, uh, people say, well, why do you believe that, that Christ is the Savior? I say, well, what are the mathematical odds against all of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person and him not being the Savior? That there's someone who's going to fulfill them even more. You know, it's, it's impossible. He's, he's obviously the Savior. Besides the words of the prophets, there are types. Type is our English transliteration of the Greek word typos. And typos, by a type, we mean like a category. Well, that's a type of clothing. Well, that's a type of table. But the word typos means something else. A typos means an actual person <coughs> or an event in the Old Testament that is both historically actual but also a prefiguration of the New Testament. Do you remember that from last year? Yeah. Vlad knows this. We learned this last year at Holy Wisdom. So a type is a, a, prefi an, a prophecy in, in the flesh or in action. For example, um, can you remember examples I gave of types, Vlad? When, um, <clears throat> when, uh, when, uh, what's it called? He was sacrificed. Abraham. Abraham sacrificed, sacrificed. Isaac. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's a type of sacrificing a lamb to God. Oh, it was sacrificing the sacrifice of whom? When Isaac. Jesus. Jesus. When Isaac Jesus. carried the wood for the sacrifice, that symbolizes Jesus carrying the cross. The cross. See, so the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham was a type. Isaac carrying the wood of the sacrifice up Mount Moriah is a type, a prefiguration of Christ carrying the wood of the cross. And there are, there are many, many, many others. I mean, the crossing of the, the passing through the Red Sea is a type of the sacrament of baptism, where we pass through the water and come from death to life, and, and on and on and on. So even before the history of the visible, cre now, so there are types of the, there, there are countless types and countless prophecies in the Old Testament. But even before the history of the Old Testament, even before the visible creation, there are the endless eons of angelic time, of the ages. When we say, in Greek we say, to the ages of ages. What are we talking, why, have you ever thought about why we're saying that? Is it just a poetic way of saying forever? It's not, it actually has a very specific <laughs> theological meaning. The, the, the eons, the eons are the periods of angelic time. 
that in relation to us, angels seem like they have no time. Right? But in relation to God, even the angels have time. Only God is truly outside of time. So, and the angels, in some sense, have this angelic time. But that time is so great, it's so vast, it's so beyond our imagining that, that we have a different word for it. Human beings live in centuries or millennia. The angels live in the eons. Okay. So even before the creation of the world are the eons of angelic time, which is unimaginably vast. Okay. And then we have the whole history of the creation of the world and all the centuries and millennia leading up to the coming of Christ. And the culmination of all of this is the coming of Christ into the world. But there's a little interruption. There's a very nasty interruption in this beautiful process, which is that our first parents fell in paradise, and this visible world became the kingdom of Satan. Okay. The night before he dies, our Lord says, the prince of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. The prince of this world, he means Satan. So the, 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 after the fall of our first parents, all the visible creation comes under the dominion of Satan and his fallen angels. And it's very important to remember that the world, this world, outside of grace, right, apart from baptism, apart from grace, apart from the sacraments, apart from the church, this world is under the dominion of, of Satan. And that, that's another way of explaining why all the ideologies about making heaven on earth are very dangerous, they're very false. Because ultimately, if you want to, if you claim you can make a permanent heaven on earth, right, as we said back in communist times, right, the bright Soviet future, right, that never comes, right, because it's, it's always somewhere over the horizon. But if you have this idea, right, this is a, this is an exaltation and a, 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 about, and it, it's a delusion about this fallen world, right, because ultimately, the, all the energies of this world, even though all energies are created by God. There are no energies that are not created by God. But all the energies of this world, apart from grace, right, apart from faith and grace and baptism and being in the church, all these energies have been fatally infected by demonic energy. So all the energies people run around busily building castles for this world, right? Their life in this world are doomed. Right? Uh, and apart from Christ, they're, they're actually even demonized. Right? They're part of the kingdom of Satan. Now, history before Christ is a progress of the ages toward the consummation of the, the ages. And the, this consummation is the coming of the kingdom, the breaking in of God's kingdom into this world, and the destruction of the power of the devil and death and hell. The Lord has a parable, or he, or he speaks in, in imagery at one point in the gospel. And he, says, he says, unless a strong man guards his house, a stronger man will come in and tie him up and pilfer his house, right? pillage his house. Well, the strong man is Satan. The stronger man right, is Christ, who comes into Satan's house, this world. He ties him up. That is, he, he neutralizes his power, and he steals his property, meaning souls. Right? Basically, we're, we're captured goods. Right? Christ, our good king, has captured us away from slavery, from belonging to the devil. Okay? So all the, all the history of the world up to this point where Jesus announces the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's all this preparation. So our understanding of history, really, our orthodox understanding of history is very deeply rooted, not simply 2,000 years ago with Christ, which is the most important point of history, right? but and not even thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, the beginning of the world, but even in the, in the eons of angelic time before the creation of the world. So yeah, that's our perspective. And that's the orthodox perspective. And that perspective helps us to see everything going on around us with peace. Right? Because our, the church is so deeply rooted in time and in eternity. So it makes you realize how small, how little are the, the events we think are so great right, that, are going, that are going on around us. So the, that was the preface. Now let's talk about the early church. The first words we hear the Lord Jesus Christ say in the Gospels as he begins his ministry after his baptism and temptation in the desert are, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, in Matthew 4, 17. And Mark, the words are, the time is, the time is fulfilled, which has two meanings. 
time is fulfilled could all could mean this is the moment, this is the time, it's happening, this is what you've been waiting for. But also the time is fulfilled it also means time is over. Time as you have always known it is over. Something new is starting, a whole new a existence, a new understanding of time itself is starting. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The Lord has come to end the dominion of Satan and to inaugurate the kingdom of God. Before, the Old Testament church was on the defensive. They were doing a holding action on the territory of Satan, the world, waiting for their deliverance. So the Old Testament church was always very small. And within the Old Testament church, there were only a very few holy people, like a little thin line of holy people. Every year on the Sundays before Christmas, the two Sundays before Christmas, you know, we, we celebrate the saints of the Old Testament. I like to point out to everybody at that time how thin this line is. On some generations, there was just one holy person upholding everybody else. Right? The miracle that Abraham even appeared, that, that, that of this Abraham in the whole world, only Abraham knew the worship of the real God. The miracle that he still did. Right? That God always preserved this tiny remnant, this line. Okay. So the Old Testament church was small on the defensive, a very small group waiting for the coming of the Lord. But the New Testament church, we're going to have a church that covers many nations. Ultimately, before the end of the world, it will be all the nations. Right? As, the, as, as, as the Lord says in his eschatological discourses in the Gospels. And not only thousands, but hundreds of thousands and even millions of saints. It's the power of grace, right? the power of Christ's resurrection in the church. The deliverer has come, and especially after the resurrection of Christ, after his ascension and the giving of the Holy Spirit, the church goes on the offensive. She is to go forth and make disciples of all nations. As it says in Matthew 28, the Lord's last instructions for the ascension. Go forth, it says, Mati uh, Sater. The, the King James says, teach all nations, but it's not quite precise. Matitevsate is more, is richer. Make disciples of all nations. <coughs> not just teach them like a class, but make them followers. Initiate them. Make them, make them true Christians. Okay. So now let's go back, thinking about this, about all those endless eons of angelic time, then the long history of the Old Testament. Let's go back and read a hymn at the, at the top of the notes as a little preface, I put a, a hymn that we chant. We chanted last Saturday night. Because it was, this week we're in Plagal of the First Tone. And, um, oh, I didn't put in the tone. It's Fourth Secret of the Lord, I cried, <coughs> Plagal of the First Tone. Great Vespers of Saturday. Evening worship do we offer thee the unwaning light, who in the end of the ages, through the flesh as in a mirror, has shined upon the world, and has descended even unto Hades and dispelled the darkness there, and has shown the light of the resurrection unto the nations. O giver of light, Lord, glory be to thee. Now, St. John of Damascus, who wrote these words, lived in the 8th century, the 700s. He's writing 700 years after Christ, but he's saying that Jesus Christ came at the end of the ages. Now, you might say, well, in the early church, the first century, they thought Christ was going to come any minute. So maybe it would make sense for them to write at the end of the ages. But now St. John, he's lived 700 years later. Doesn't he realize Christ didn't come at the end of the ages, that there was more time after Christ? Why is St. John writing this? Okay. Because St. John, his mindset in the 8th century is exactly the same as the mindset of the early church, which is that in a, in a sense, in a very real sense, Christ coming to the world put an end to history as people knew it. That now we th we're, we're accustomed to thinking of 2,000 years of Christian history. See? And we're just part of history. But really, we're part of something that's after history. We're, the, we're in the in-between time, between his first coming and his second coming. So we're not bound by history. In a sense, before Christ came, people were kind of bound by history. They were bound by historical processes. Why? Because Satan was running the show, you see. Although, of course, everything was still under the providence of God. But they weren't experiencing that so much as experiencing the dominion of Satan and the tyranny of corruption and death. What's the most, what's the most frightening manifestation of time? Our own death, right? Sickness, corruption, death, things wearing down, things running down. What the second law of thermodynamics, right? Entropy, everything just runs down. 
So apart from Christ, apart from his coming to the world, man experiences time as what? Tyranny. Right? The tyrant death, tyrant time. I'm racing. I've, I don't have enough time. I've got to catch up. I don't have time to do all the things I wanted. Time's running out. With Christ coming into the world, he's saying, no, I'm inaugurating the heavenly kingdom, and I've plucked you out of time. Yes, you're still living in time because you're in the body, but you're really between the now and the not yet. You're really betwixt and between. If you could only see the time you're really living in, you realize that as a baptized Orthodox Christian, you're already outside of time. Right? Time already is not a tyrant over you. In a way, history ended, and a new history after history began. So the churches, the New Testament church's history is a history after history. That old dead history, that's over. Christ put into all that. We're living in, we're, we're living right on the doorstep of the eternal kingdom. And this is how the early Christians had this very intense understanding of this. Now we get this intense understanding at, at moments, you know, at Pascha, or when we visit a monastery. And we, we, you're in, we're in a long vigil at a monastery and time disappears. Time is no more. It's timeless. We had this I had this experience last week. Where I, I had the privilege of burying a priest last week. I'd never done that before. It was a five-hour service after we had a two-hour liturgy. So seven hours in church. But at the end of it, we were tired, but there was no time. You really, you really realized that we had stepped outside of time. See, So this is, as we begin our study of Christian history, let us remember as our foundation that we're not enslaved to time. Because slavery to time is just part of that whole slavery of the lie of materialism, right? Being enslaved to this world. Just being the, the helpless victim of historical processes, right? Which is really how people have been taught, whether they've ever read Karl Marx or not, whether they've ever read Hegel or not, even the, the most ordinary person just is just brainwashed to believe that we're all just helpless victims of historical processes, which people, why people get so angry, right? The help, we're victims. Right? We can't help it. Right? We're just the and uh, the uh, of course all the brainwashing of Darwinism and Marxism and all these things have just taken advantage of all of, of just um, brainwashed people with this idea, right? Because they lost their hope in the resurrection. And they're looking for a false deliverance, and so these ideologies just took hold of their minds. Even the the ideologies were created by evil people who want to just control you because they know it's not true, right? They're in touch with de devils. They know where they're going after they die, right? And uh, what they've chosen, right? But they're convincing all the regular people that they're just made of ma material stuff and that, and that they're just subject to historical processes and you're helpless, right? It's a big lie. We are not, we baptize Orthodox Christians, we members of the church are not slaves of time. We live after the end of the ages. The end of the ages is when Jesus came to the world. Okay? He's going to come back to consummate all of this, to consummate the consummation. But in a very real sense, we're already living, to the extent we live our baptism, we're already living in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the early church had a very intense, my point of talking about Pascha and the funeral and long vigils at monasteries was to give an idea of how the early Christians felt all the time. They felt like the way all the time. And they were not concerned with this world so much. They were concerned with the next world. The early church had an intense awareness of this. Therefore, we can characterize the life of the early church. And, then, and by, by the early church, I should put, I'm going to improve these notes. And one way is, one way to improve them is to put the actual timeline. <coughs> right, from 33 AD to 313. What happens at 313? Constantine. St. Constantine, right, legalizes Christianity, right? So from, from the early, from the, the, res, the ascension of Christ to St. Constantine, We'll call that the early church, right? The church that was, Ill, that was not in power, that was uh, uh, illegal in the Roman Empire, right? Or uh, periodically illegal and periodically persecuted. There were actually ten great persecutions recorded by Eusebius. So the, the, so the early church, the catacomb church, we also call it, right? Because they often had to, they worship, would worship in the catacombs. The catacombs are an image of the Christians hiding and having uh, fleeing persecution, right? The, the early catacomb church had an intense awareness of the, all this we've been talking about. Therefore, we can characterize her life as intensely eschatological. Ta eschata in Greek means the last things. So eschatology is the study of the last things. 
what's going to happen at the end of the world. And the, the early Christians had a very eschatological awareness. They were always thinking about the second coming and about the next world. Okay? The early church set the tone for the entire life of the church until now. We always refer back to the early church right, as the benchmark. So the, the true church is characterized by the same things that characterize the early church, because it's the same church. Right? It's the, true, the true church is eschatological, otherworldly, martyric, and ascetical. Okay. What does that mean? The early Christians expected the Lord to return any minute. The fact that he did not return their lifetime, or the lives between them and us, does not dim the reality that he could return any minute. That's why we still, year after year, we reread the parable of, of, the, of the ten virgins, right? The five who were wise and the five who were foolish. And so many other words of our Lord about his, his coming again, right? So because we're expecting the coming of Christ, and also, by the way, we're ex we, we are expecting our own death. We don't know when Christ is going to return. We know he's going to return. We don't know the moment of our death, but we know we're going to die. We know without any doubt that we're going to die. So even whether we live to see the second coming or not, we're going to meet Christ. Right? And, it, and that moment is not far off for each of us. Okay. <clears throat> the entire life of the church is characterized, therefore, by an otherworldly attitude. If this life is short, if Christ could return any minute, if I could die any minute, that means that not this world, but that next world where I'm going is the primary concern. So the real church is otherworldly, otherworldly. That doesn't mean we don't take care of our worldly duties. All of us here, I can look around, we're all very responsible people, right? We're all paying our bills, we're all working hard, we're taking care of our children. But as Christians, the foundation for that and what takes away our worries, right, takes away our, our getting obsessed with our worldly duties so that we know that this isn't our permanent real home. We're, we're, we're going somewhere else. St. Paul says our life is hidden with Christ and God. Our real life is somewhere else. It's there, not here. So since it's not here but there, therefore the Christian is not afraid to be a martyr, to die for his faith. The martyrs go rejoicing to their death. They receive this grace, even though they feel the pain, in another way they don't feel it because they're so full of this otherworldly joy that they're going to meet the Lord. We know from the accounts, not only the ancient martyrs, we can talk about martyrs in, within the lifetime of people we know, martyrs under communism, right, in the gulag, in the concentration camps, and torture chambers, and they'll come out from the, the camps and say, you know, that was the happiest time of my life. How could that be the happiest time of their life? Because they transcended the limitations of this world. They were with Christ. Right? They were in intense prayer, experiencing the presence of Jesus Christ. They were living already in the next world. And in a way, they kind of regretted coming back to ordinary life. Yeah, that sounds strange, but it's, it's an evidence of grace, right? The great grace that's in the church, right? So while we're waiting, but while we're waiting to die, if we're not being martyrs, we have to be ascetics in a greater or lesser extent. Now, we're living in the world. We have families. We have children. We have jobs. And so we can't be ascetics in the way that someone living in a monastery is or certainly living in a hermitage is. But every true Christian life is an ascetic life. It means denying ourselves. It means controlling our appetites and desires. That's why the church has fasting, why we have prostrations, why we have long services. Right? Why we're trained to govern our eyes, govern our tongue. Right? Askesis, this ascetic, word ascetic is from Greek askesis. It means training. We're all in training. Right? All of true Christian life involves askesis, involves asceticism. So we're denying the flesh. Why? To keep vigil for the second coming. We're waiting for our master to come. The Lord has a parable where he says, you know, blessed is the servant who governs the house well. But if the Lord comes back and finds a servant drinking, getting drunk and beating the servants, so where he's going to punish him. Okay. Well, that's an image of ourselves. We have to be not drinking, not getting drunk, that is not enslaved to our passions, not unaware, but vigilant and aware, and not beating our fellow servants, that is not, not offending our brother, and also not mistreating our earthly members, the body, right, by the passions, but by controlling our passions. So we're trying to live according to the laws of the heavenly kingdom, which is not of this world, even now, 
in this life. So the, the entire life of the early church for the first 300 years, they were intensely aware of this all the time. All the time. Why? Because they could be arrested any minute. They could die any minute for the faith. Now, the, the persecutions were periodic. There were intense points. It's kind of like a woman in labor, you know, where there are these intense points and there are these easier times. It went up and down, right? But it was, the threat was always there. And the intense expectation for the Lord's coming was always there. And so they, they, um, they lived a true, truly otherworldly life. So what is this catacomb church now? We want to apply this to ourselves. Okay? The point of, as we said last week, the point of our course is not just, this is not an academic course. We're not here just to hear interesting ideas. Right? We're here to learn how we should approach our own lives. Okay? Now in our present, our present situation, we feel like we're living um, after a lot of very things that we've treasured have been destroyed. Right? The whole experience of the last 100, 150 years, been revolutions, world wars, and in, in our own lifetime, just recently, the past few decades, the rapid disintegration of what was left of Christian culture. So we went from feeling, I, I know, I went, as a child, I felt very secure. I was, I was living, I was surrounded by people who believed the same as I did, went to the same church I did, ate the same food I did. And every, everything was so secure, right? Now, just one generation later, we feel, as Orthodox Christians, we feel very insecure in a worldly sense, because the world around us is changing so rapidly for the worse, and we feel like we're, we're isolated. Right? So we lament the destruction of our old culture. We lament the destruction of our old nations. We lament the destruction of our old ways of doing things, that we had all these support networks. We had all this support. We had all this culture. We had all this affirmation from the people around us, and it's disappearing. So we can make people <coughs> despair. But we have to remember that several things. One, this is allowed by God. That doesn't mean God wants people to be degenerate or to, or he doesn't, God doesn't want the communists to burn down churches. He doesn't want uh, certain movements to corrupt the children. No. But God, in his wisdom, he's letting man choose, and man is choosing all these bad things. But God is going to bring about our salvation through this. It's being allowed by God, and God loves each one of us, and he envisioned right, each one of us in all eternity, and he chose to put us in this time for our salvation. Okay. You know, I've often, you know, when I'm, I'm having temptation, I think, oh, oh, Lord, why didn't I live uh, a few hundred years ago in, 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 in uh, Russia or Greece or Romania or somewhere, and, and I could have been just the third priest in a big cathedral and just had to serve liturgy every day and then teach children. And, and, of course, God's answer is, that's none of your business. That's a fantasy. Right? Besides that, you probably would have died of the plague when you were five. So <laughs> you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have lived to be a priest or teach children anyway. You see? And so God, God knows what each of us needs for his or her salvation. So you're placed in this position. And also remember, our church, the Orthodox Church, was born, born in the catacombs. The experience of the early Christians was not, oh, everybody believes in orthodoxy. Oh, there's a beautiful Orthodox culture. Their experience is that we're surrounded by pagans. We're surrounded by people who believe in demons. We're surrounded by people who don't like us. But we are united by our love for Christ. And so we're united by love for each other. And we're, we're secure because our life isn't anchored in this world. Our life is already has a much firmer anchor in the next world. And, and all the torturers and the arrests, the imprisonments, the persecution can't take that away from us. Right? We're invincible. So the church knows how to live. The church knows how to live in beautiful cathedrals and with the crowns of kings. Uh, and she also knows how to live in the catacombs and in the prisons. So ultimately, uh, orthodoxy, that's a typo. Orthodoxy is not about anything in this world, but the kingdom which has come is coming now among us and will come. If you look at the iconostas, uh, at the Templon, what do we see? We see the Templon, we see the Mother of God is to our left of the Holy Gates, right? and the icon of Christ with the closed book is to the right of the, of the beautiful gate. What does this mean? The, 
the mother of God holding the child is the icon of the incarnation. This is the first coming of Christ, his first coming into the world. The icon of Christ holding the book, it's a closed book. Okay? It's, this is Christ the judge. The book is closed. Christ the teacher, the book is open, and there's a gospel verse. But when the book's closed, that means, all right, you've had a chance to learn your lesson. The book is closed now. He's Christ the judge. This is an icon of the second coming. What's in between? He comes to us every day and every Sunday, especially Sundays and feast days, in his word, the Holy Gospel, we read from there, and especially Holy Communion. That's his in-between coming. There's his first coming, his second coming, but right now it's his in-between coming. He comes, he's coming to us all the time. He's constantly coming to us, both in his word that we hear and we accept in faith, and his very self coming inside of us. He's here at this moment. You see. So he is the one who has come. He will come, but he's also he's coming right now. He comes right now among us. When the, the, the priests uh, give each other the kiss of peace before the creed, they say Christ is among us. Christ is between us. And the response is he is and shall be. See. So all of our study of history has this framework, or this foundation rather, <coughs> see, this background and foundation. Um, so the, the early church then sets the tone for the entire history of the church. So as we go through the history of the church, we can constantly refer back to this vision of the early church as a, as a benchmark. And this should give us great peace. Um, knowing that our true life is there with Christ. and that So all the events of this world, all the vicissitudes, the changes, the challenges, the difficulties, all of it must be seen in light of the endless eons of time that went even before the beginning of the world and this vast history of the Old Testament and then the triumph of our Lord over all evil, over all, the devil and death and sin and hell. It's, he's completely destroyed the power of these things over us. And now we're just waiting. We're waiting, we're waiting for the Lord, and this should give us peace. Okay, is, are there any questions or observations about what I was thinking that what's one of the most important things for, for us to make sure that we protect our children? Yes. And the protection meaning uh, protecting 